All right, welcome. Folks, nice to see you. I'm Gabriel Brahm, and I'm the director of the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom. We promote viewpoint diversity and free speech and open inquiry on campus. And uh, toward that end, we invite the best speakers on the most important topics uh, to address our community uh, a few times a, a year. And uh, we started with this last year. We intend to continue it with it throughout uh, this year and hopefully on uh, to the next. Coming up uh, later this year, Patrick Deneen will be in town in March. He wrote a book called Why Liberalism Failed. And uh, I hope you'll keep an eye out for that event. In April, Greg Lukianoff <laughs> will uh, be here to talk about the coddling of the American mind, uh, how good intentions and bad ideas are setting up a generation for failure a book you may have heard discussed on NPR and other places. In fact, both of these books and both of these authors are um, being discussed uh, a lot um, these days. Uh, tonight's lecture I, 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 I uh, am greatly looking forward to and is of uh, at least, I, th I think, equal importance and relevance um, to those coming up. Uh, in fact, there's no one I'd rather hear from tonight uh, uh, than our speaker and no book I, th I think I'd rather uh, participate in discussing than uh, his latest book. Before we begin, I'd like to ask Emma Fellows to come up and just make a brief announcement about the Jewish uh, Student Union. Tonight's event is sponsored by the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom and co-sponsored by the Politics Department and the Jewish Student Union. And so, a brief announcement about the uh, Jewish Student Union from our president. Uh, I'm the faculty uh, advisor. Here she is. Hello, uh, my name is Emma Fellows. I'm the president of the Jewish Student Union. Um, we're a new club this year, and we're open to all students on campus. Our organization. Um, revolves around engaging political, cultural, and overall open-minded conversation. We will be sending around an email list, so if anyone is interested, you can sign up to join or just know about future events. And um, we're really excited to be taking part in events such as the one as this evening, and we hope to see you guys in the future. Thank you. So if anyone wants to sign up on the JSU email list, here's your chance. So, the fascist comes to town and says, round up the Jews and the bicyclists. To which the good people of the town respond, why the bicyclists? And the fascist answers, why the Jews? In other words, while anti-Semitism focuses on the Jews, it isn't really about the Jews, it's about the fascist anti-Semites whose worldview is a kind of conspiracy theory in need of conspirators. And while anti-Semitism starts with the Jews, it doesn't stop there. Fascism threatens all of us. For Robert Bowers, the uh, mass murderer who attacked the Tree of Life synagogue in Pittsburgh, the Jews are responsible for bringing the immigrants to destroy the white race. Not only that, but President Trump is a tool of the Jews, a pawn in the Jewish conspiracy to subject the world to Jewish domination. Anti-Semitism is a conspiracy theory, and it's one that's much beloved of fascists and those that we now uh, speak of as being on the alt-right. In this uh, worldview, uh, which Bowers uh, holds. He's apparently a figure of the alt-right uh, indeed. And his worldview, I think it should be noted in passing, weirdly echoes that of the postmodern left, the academic left, the identity politics left, or the intersectional left, as it's called today, for whom 
President Trump is, of course, a tool of the Zionists, a servant of the Jewish state of Israel. So there's something in common there between the alt-right and the far left, but I digress. We have not come here tonight to discuss hatred of Israel on the left, after all, or nihilist opposition to liberal democracy in the left-wing academy, but the palpable threat of resurgent fascism from the white nationalist far right around the world today. No one is better equipped, in uh, my view, to address this gravely important subject than tonight's speaker. Briefly, before I introduce him, a few quick uh, words of thanks. Thanks to the Institute for Humane Studies at George Mason for uh, generously funding uh, tonight's event. Thanks to the Politics Department for uh, chipping in, and as I mentioned, the Jewish Student Union. Thanks to Tim Eggert, my Sancho Panza, my research assistant, and the center's first undergraduate fellow. Ronald Beener was born in 1953 and was educated at McGill and at Balliol College, Oxford. He is a professor of political science at the University of Toronto, where he has taught political theory since 1984. He was elected in 2006 as a fellow of the Royal Society of Canada. He has also been a visiting professor at the Hebrew University of Jerusalem and has held visiting research fellowships at the University of St. Andrews and London Metropolitan University. In 1983, Beener published an edition of Hannah Arendt's lectures on Kant's political philosophy. The book has generated a very broad literature within political theory in the decades since it was published. It has also been published, by the way, in no less than 16 foreign language editions. Beener has published six other edited volumes, either as editor or co-editor, and he is the author of the following books, Political Judgment, What's the Matter with Liberalism, winner of the McPherson Prize for the best book in uh, political theory for the year it came out in 1992, Philosophy in a Time of Lost Spirit, Liberalism, Nationalism, Citizenship, Civil Religion, my own uh, personal favorite of uh, his great uh, books, uh, one that means a lot to me and that I recommend to you highly. Uh, it's also forthcoming in Chinese, by the way. Uh, he's the author, as well, of Political Philosophy, why it, What It Is and Why It Matters, published in 2014. Most recently, he's the author of the timely book that brings us here tonight, Dangerous Minds, Nietzsche, Heidegger, and the Return of the Far Right. And if you haven't yet had a chance to read it, I urge you uh, to do so. After Ronnie's talk, our own Professor Jonathan Allen of the pol Politics Department here, Political Science Department uh, here at NMU, will respond briefly. And then it's your turn to ask questions, to engage in discussion, there's a mic set up here, so I hope you'll uh, line up and um, have your say. It's important to me as the director of the Center for Academic and Intellectual Freedom that these events aren't workshops where some expert tells you what to think to improve your behavior. A after the, the, the speaker presents uh, Food for Thought, it's our job to consume it and uh, if you don't like it, uh, maybe, you know, have a civil kind of civilized food fight if you want to throw uh, a little back uh, at uh, the speaker, just as long as you're polite about it. Um, Jonathan Allen, by the way, is a dear friend of many years, um, an accomplished political theorist in his own right, uh, as you'll see shortly, and I uh, can't thank him enough for uh, his work on behalf of the center. In fact, tonight's event, would not have been possible without him. Without uh, f further uh, ado, let me just uh, say one more thing. I'm gonna send around notepads for you if you'd be kind enough and if you'd like to. It's not required, but it's encouraged. 
uh, if you want to, sign up uh, uh, with your email and we'll let you know about future, those future events I, I mentioned and uh, you won't um, miss out. Ladies and uh, gentlemen, Ronald uh, Wiener. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Gabe. I'm truly uh, thrilled and honored to be here at NMU. And uh, I'm a recipient of just outstanding hospitality from Gabe and, and, and Jonathan and their colleagues and their students. So I'm really grateful for the, the, the warmth uh, with which I've been received here in Marquette. Thanks so much. Uh, okay, so before I start, I, I'm just going to say a few words about the uh, image that I've had projected here because people may be a little puzzled as to why I uh, put, uh, had this uh, put up. Uh, so this comes from a, uh, a Facebook page of a Andreas Umlands, who's a uh, well-known scholar of Alexander Dugin, who is a notable and quite dangerous Russian fascist. And uh, as people may be aware, uh, Steve Bannon has uh, characterized the uh, age of Trump as the birth of a new political order. Well, this uh, uh, schema, this diagram, uh, for me represents, it's a kind of schematic representation. I mean, the whole thing's a joke, of course, but a kind of very serious joke. Uh, if you want to put it that way. Uh, it's a kind of schematization of Bannon's new uh, political order. Now, this was from a couple of years ago, so you'd have to do some up, uh, updating of the, uh, di of the diagram. So as we know, Jeff Sessions no longer attorney general. Uh, Bannon was uh, escorted out of the White House. Uh, uh, Spencer and Kuprianova are in the middle of pretty ugly divorce proceedings. So, you know, there you need some minor revisions, but the basic structure of it, I think, is intact. And of course, we don't know uh, that Bannon is right, that we have, we are witnessing the birth uh, uh, of a new political order. Uh, uh, God help us if, if he is right about that. We'll have to see. But it's certainly not guaranteed that, he, that he's wrong about that. Uh, it, we may indeed be uh, spectac you know, spectators of uh, a, a, new per, a new political order. I mean, what it means basically uh, uh, is that the uh, you know, mainstream politics defined by the center right and the center left just drops away and becomes completely relevant and politics becomes a battlefield, a battleground between uh, what he calls the populist right and the populist left, his idea being that the populist right will vanquish uh, the populist left, and that will be the new uh, landscape for our epoch. Uh, so that's a kind of very, for me, very scary prospect. And this is a kind of jokey kind of, uh, you know, schematization of, of the new order. And uh, so there you have it. So that's why I had that image put up. And uh, you'll see it's. Uh, uh, the talk I'll be giving and the book on which the talk's based uh, is relevant to all that. Okay, switch over to my reading glasses. Okay. It would be nice to think that fields of academic study such as philosophy and political theory are innocent and that one could teach them without the fear of uh, breeding monstrosities. That comforting thought is looking less reliable by the day, which is what prompted me to write a book whose title is Dangerous Minds. Literally, the first book review came from someone who is himself a dangerous mind Greg Johnson, who, writes, uh, who, who runs a white nationalist website called uh, Countercurrents, where he published the review. Subscribers to the New York Times may remember him from one of the three shocking videos accompanying the Jesse Singal report entitled Undercover with the Alt-Right. Johnson, there's kind of three embedded videos in the online version of the story. Johnson's in the middle video. 
And in that video, uh, I mean, they're only three minutes each, but you kind of get the core of his view, vision of the world in those three minutes. Uh, and you should, if you haven't already seen these videos, you should definitely uh, watch them because it's a kind of window into the kind of scary, scary world that we're uh, concerned with here. Uh, so Johnson, in his video, uh, argued that Jews like me should be required to move to their own ethnostate allowing the United States to be, by, by, uh, to be what by rights it should be, a white ethnostate. As uh, primary targets and victims of European fasci fascism in the 20th century, Jews have special reason to be fearful of any revival of this ugly politics or variations thereof. But alas, revival of it is precisely what we are currently seeing in Russia, in Europe, and even here in the United States. Uh, and judging by the uh, slogans, vicious slogans chanted in Charlottesville in August of 2017, uh, and judging even more so uh, by the horrific slaughter of synagogue goers in Pittsburgh several, several weeks ago, uh, and also some of the things being seen in present-day Poland and present-day Hungary, Jews, uh, it seems, have not ceased to be the prime targets of 21st century fascists. So back to Greg Johnson. His review was uh, 5,000 words long, a pretty long review of the book, and it took him until precisely the sixth word of this 5,000-word review to identify me, target me, as Jewish. In the review, he also wrote the following. Beener, like many Jewish commentators, seems to feel that Maren Heidegger owes him a personal apology for the Holocaust. For Johnson, Heidegger's ranting in the notorious black notebooks about a global Jewish conspiracy is not blameworthy because Johnson himself shares the same views. Uh, no, so for those people who uh, aren't schooled in philosophy, so Heidegger is one of the towering figures in 20th century philosopher, pro probably the most uh, single influential philosopher uh, of the last hun hundred years. Uh, and yet he, uh, like these alt-right people, uh, proved himself vulnerable to uh, cra crazy conspiracy theories uh, about uh, Jews. Okay, so how could uh, someone with extremist views uh, like those held by Greg Johnson have anything to do with a humanizing discipline like philosophy? And yet Johnson, in fact, holds a PhD in philosophy from Catholic University of America, uh, as we're uh, informed uh, by a report on him posted by the Southern Poverty Law Center, which tracks racists and fascists and uh, dangerous people. Uh, and he wrote uh, a doctoral thesis on Immanuel Kant and Immanuel Swedenborg, and he's apparently taught philosophy at a number of colleges. Evidently, Kant's moral egalitarianism left little impression on him. Remarkably, Johnson has posted a mini-essay on the cro Cross Currents uh, site, again, it's a Nazi website, entitled A Philosopher's Education, giving students advice, uh, largely helpful advice, actually, on how to choose philosophy programs at liberal arts institutions, and celebrating the advantage advantages of a traditional liberal education. There's also a companion piece by Johnson on the same website entitled Graduate School with Heidegger. Reading these intelligent blogs, one would have no reason to imagine that Johnson is anything other than a perfectly conventional humanistic scholar, which from the abhorrent sidebars running alongside his essays on this Nazi website, one knows he emphatically is not. In fact, it would be naive to think that intellectual life can be relied upon to generate only benevolent and humanistic worldviews. Immanuel Kant gave us the immortal line, one of the most important lines probably that we get from the history of philosophy, out of the crooked timber of humanity, nothing can ever be made straight. 
And if the epigram is on target, and one doesn't really know very much about human nature if one thinks it isn't, <laughs> then it will inevitably encompass what goes on in the precincts of academic and intellectual life. We academics, we intellectuals, are not exempt from that principle, that crookedness of human nature. But if that is true, then that poses a pretty substantial uh, a problem of pretty substantial proportions for us academics. How do we teach the canonical texts that in significant measure define our mission as educators, knowing that they contain the potential to produce monsters? The potential, I mean, it doesn't mean we're producing monsters on a regular basis, one hopes, but that potential is always there. It's a very scary thought. Can one raise the largest questions in political theory and philosophy without opening a door to dangerous extremes. It has been known since Socrates, who practiced philosophy in the company of dubious figures like Critias and Al Alcibiades, that there is an uneasy relationship between the life of the mind and the potentially violent vortex of the political. Plato, too, played with fire by putting himself in the service of Sicilian tyrants and he most likely wrote the Republic out of an awareness that potential tyrants are drawn precisely to philosophy's root and branch questioning of established social conventions. It's like a magnet for potential tyrants. It's one of the important insights of Plato's Republic. To this very day, there are people who read ancient texts not in spite of the fact that the ancient world embodied slavery, imperialism, and cruelty, but on account of a fa fetishizing fascination with those very things. Uh, for evidence of that claim, uh, check out the uh, uh, op-ed in the Washington Post uh, by um, Donna Zuckerberg, Mark Zuckerberg's sister, who's a classicist, uh, the article is entitled, Guess Who's Championing Homer? Radical Online Conservatives. That came on the Washington Post two weeks ago. And uh, also, uh, an interview with Zuckerberg that came out in The Guardian uh, just a couple of days ago, which, and both are easily available online. One can't be true to the vocation of political theory without engaging both intellectually and pedagogically with the most radical minds. But one must do so always with the vivid awareness that many of the thinkers who loom large within our theory canon did contribute to, even if they weren't directly responsible for, terror and atrocity committed by those they influenced. Jean-Jacques Rousseau, Karl Marx come immediately to mind, and two other thinkers uh, who, uh, are, who are relevant to that uh, I'll be discussing in this lecture. Of course, we could solve the problem by resolving only to teach ironic theorists such as Locke, Montesquieu, and John Stuart Mill, but it's telling that even Mill himself would be mightily unhappy with that supposed solution. Now, teaching Nietzsche, Frederick Nietzsche, is particularly problematical. And he's one of the two main thinkers who I focus on in my book. Undergraduates love Nietzsche and hence are all too vulnerable to his seductive rhetoric. In fact, Nietzsche, in the gay science, shows that he, he knows that he has this power to seduce. He confesses his deliberate goal of titillating and enticing the young. He writes, what thrills young men is the sight of the zeal surrounding a cause, and so to speak, the sight of the burning match, not, not the cause itself. The subtler seducers, and obviously think of himself here, subtler seducers therefore know how to create in them the expectation of an explosion. Reasons are not the way to win over these power kegs, powder kegs. He prided himself on being dynamite, capable of setting off unprecedented cataclysms. For generations, scholars of Nietzsche have tried to minimize or play down 
his dangerousness. But the reality is that he remains a potent resource for sinister ideologies that are currently gaining ground. And that's, that's what this is about. In an exchange with the Canadian political theorist George Grant, uh, uh, it's, uh, it's an exchange cited in my book, uh, the political German-American political philosopher Leo Strauss <coughs> expresses his anxieties about the dangers of popularizing Nietzsche's philosophy. And it's a quote from the biography. Strauss strongly believed that Nietzsche was a writer of such intoxicating destructiveness that he should not be discussed in the presence of people without philosophic training. His ideas might do them harm. I mean, Grant was considering doing a radio series on Nietzsche. He actually gave, <laughs> did that radio series, and he consulted with Strauss about the wisdom of doing that. Strauss obviously didn't succeed in dissuading him, uh, but uh, probably Grant was a little uneasy, otherwise he wouldn't have sought uh, Strauss's counsel in the first place. So Strauss said that Nietzsche had a right to think what he thought, but it was dubious if he ever should have written it down. And it was even further dubious that he should have ever published it. Now, before rushing to assume that Strauss is exaggerating the possible hazards of exposing the young to Nietzsche's inflammatory texts, consider Richard B. Spencer, America's most notorious white nationalist, who is down there alongside his uh, soon-to-be ex-wife. Uh, Spencer attended three great universities, the University of Virginia, the University of Chicago, and Duke University. And by his own account, the decisive turning point on the path that led him to celebrity with his uh, infamous Hail Trump speech soon after Trump's election was a graduate seminar on Nietzsche that he took at the second of these three great universities, at the University of Chicago. He famously described it in trademark alt-right vocabulary as his having been red-pilled by Nietzsche. Well, when I teach a seminar on Nietzsche, is there any guarantee that a future Richard Spencer won't be in the room? And that's something that currently uh, haunts me a bit. Jonathan, you teach Nietzsche? You do. Okay, so we both teach Nietzsche, so we're both... Uh, anxious about this problem. Uh, there's a powerful profile of Spencer, the title of the article is I See a Darkness, by a former friend and classmate of Spencer's named David Ohm and published in 2017 in an online journal called The Point. Ohm discusses how Spencer would say outrageously provocative things but say them with a discern, disarming smirk or say them in a way that suggested he was being ironical. As Ohm began, to, uh, began writing his story, he had a couple of phone conversations with his ex-friend. Spencer made clear that his dissembling uh, in Chicago, where they were both grad students, was a kind of uh, Straussian esotericism. Spencer himself uh, actually did, puts, puts it in those terms. Uh, I mean, Chicago's kind of famous, uh, you know, site of uh, Straussian scholarship and so on, so that's not surprising. So uh, uh, Spencer, as he articulated it, as an adher adherent uh, of the radical rights, uh, was in effect subject to persecution by the decadent liberal and multicultural mil milieu in which he found himself. Uh, Spencer said to Ohm, we're all trapped in a multicultural decaying world. And his smirks and his irony were a way to mask his true radicalism. The dissembling via a pose of irony ended in around 2010, to 2010 when Spencer founded uh, altright.com, uh, uh, you know, a radical right website. Uh, I'm okay. Thanks. Uh, 
I'm suggesting ideas that will change the world. That's what Spencer said. Hence, he decided that he should no longer cushion the harshness of what he believed in. He, he is a revolutionary. He's committed to a, uh, uh, a uh, top-to-bottom revolution in the social world, and he comes out of the closet as the, uh, as, as the uh, uh, radical conservative revolutionary that he is. Alm says that he allowed himself to be fooled by the pose of friendly congeniality during the time in Chicago because it was easier than facing up to the true Spencer. Alm's concluding commentary is quite thought-provoking. He writes, if we had been willing to consider Spencer's worldview alongside our own, to confront our own tacit assumptions as well as his, perhaps we would have been able to better appreciate his liberal ideas for the legitimate threat they proved to be. Maybe we would have even been able to persuade him to take a look at the world from our point of view, a and maybe not. And I think he and I strongly suspect the, the latter is true. In any case, we would be fooling ourselves if we didn't take with utter seriousness the Sp Spencer trajectory, starting with Nietzsche seminars at grad school and ending with the torch-lit uh, white nationalist rally in Charlottesville that Spencer helped organize and, you know, is uh, featured on the cover of my book. Greg Johnson, in his review, chided me and my publisher for putting Charlottesville on the cover of my book. He says that the uh, photo of the mob of neo-Nazis besieging uh, the statue of Thomas Jefferson, uh, here's Thomas Jefferson up here on the spine of the book, uh, on the campus of Spencer's Al Alma Mater, that's again, went to the University of Virginia, that's, that's where this whole thing take, took place. So, so Johnson said, oh, you put this on the cover because this is supposed to look sinister. You know, trying to make the Nazis look bad, you know. By which Johnson meant there is nothing intrinsically sinister about people modeling themselves after a Nazi rally, which is what the, the, the people in this uh, photograph are doing. I mean, the torches are not, <laughs> uh, actually, you know, chosen by accident. It's very deliberate what it's supposed to conjure up. It's, on, it's not irony, yeah, yeah. You, you can try and pretend it's on irony. It's not, there's no, no irony there. To be sure, not many people taking seminars on the thought of Friedrich Nietzsche in grad school will turn into neo-fascists. It does not follow from that fact that there aren't, aren't things in Nietzsche's work capable of turning people into neo-fascists. This is in no way uh, unique to Spencer. You know, he had the wit to refer to this as red pilling, but this is a kind, there's a pattern here in uh, 20, uh, in, 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 in 20th century fascism up to the present. Fascists from Julius Evola uh, in the mid 20th century to Alexander Dugan today, and here's another figure on my diagram here, and all of their followers uh, have always been enthusiastic Nietzscheans and not by accident. There's something in Nietzsche that they uh, hook into. Now, Martin Heidegger, uh, the other major figure treated in my book as a source for the contemporary far right or radical right or ultra right, Heidegger is no less worrying. Heidegger, no less than Nietzsche, and to a sig significant degree under Nietzsche's influence, regarded liberal democracy as a perverse and despiritualizing way of life, as he formulated it. He publicly embraced the Nazi movement and believed that it offered tremendous promise for the West's return to spiritual health and grandeur. After the Second World War, he tried to persuade people that his commitment to Hitlerism had ceased in April 1934 when he resigned as rector of Freiburg University. Many people believed him, and some still do. But it wasn't true. In a telling exchange of letters with Herbert Marcuse, 
he said that he com committed himself to fascism in the cause of spiritual renewal. And he clearly believed that that's believed that spiritual renewal would indeed have been available if the party had allowed him, rather than ideological hacks, to guide the movement. That's why he resigned as rector. As late as the famous interview with Der Spiegel conducted in 1966 and published 10 years later, Heidegger refused to distance himself from the blatantly Nazi rectoral address that he delivered in 1933. In a book published in 1954, he fairly shockingly stated, and for me this is the most shocking line in the whole of Heidegger's work, and Heidegger's work encompasses like 100 volumes, stated that the Second World War decided nothing. Obviously, because he couldn't bring himself to accept that democracy's defeat of fascist dictatorship was a definitive outcome. We just have to wait uh, decades or centuries for the next contest. Well, these are all well-known facts, but they have done nothing to diminish the spell that Heidegger has cast and continues to cast over countless readers throughout the liberal world, including legions of fans and defenders within the academy. For the attentive reader of Heidegger's work, nothing is more disturbing than the evident, uh, evident politically and strategically motivated doctoring of texts in Heidegger's post-war publications. There are two versions of Heidegger's book on Schelling. The first was published in 1971, the second published in 1988 as part of the collected works. In the part of the book corresponding to pages 22 to 23 of the uh, extant English translation, Heidegger inserts several paragraphs offering a discussion of Nietzsche's views concerning nihilism. A long sentence at the end of one of these paragraphs that appeared in the original lectures was om omitted from the 1971 version and hence is absent from the, uh, the translation uh, available in English, but was reinstated in the 1988 version, the definitive version edition of the book. Here is my translation, takes out the Nazi text in 1971, puts the Nazi text back in in 1988, because it's the 1988 version that will be read by centuries, by, by, by readers 100 years from now, 200 years from now, whatever. So here's my translation of the text that was suppressed and then later reinstated. Heidegger writes, as is well known, both of the two men in Europe who have, in the political national fashioning of their respective volks, inaugurated counter-movements to nihilism, namely Mussolini and Hitler, were in turn, each in their own way, essentially determined by Nietzsche. Still, this was so without Nietzsche's authentic metaphysical domain having properly come into its own. So Heidegger wants to let you know that he has a philosophically superior understanding of Nietzsche, you know, good for him. But, the, you know, uh, Mussolini and Hitler had a good enough understanding that they could initiate the revolution that Europe needed, the overthrowing of liberalism and democracy. So this originates, so again, the, the official, you know, story is, oh, he broke with the Nazis in 1934. But the text I just read to you is from a lecture course given in the summer of 1936, two years later. And the following winter, the 36 to 37 semester, Heidegger, Heidegger gave the first set of his lectures on Nietzsche. And here, too, there was a damning text that was omitted from the edition of 1961, yet reinstated in the 1985 collect, Collected Works edition. So the real, official, definitive uh, version of the book the Nazi text gets put back in. So here's what he writes. Europe still wants to cling to democracy, puts in square co quotes, and does not want to see that this would constitute its historical death. For democracy is, as Nietzsche clearly saw, only a degenerate form of nihilism. And the term he uses for the de 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 gen form is actually uh, Nazi, Nazi, Nazi jargon, a kind of like decadent mutation. Uh, so he's, it's, it's already you know, formulated in, in kind of Nazi vocabulary. 
Now, you, you have to read these text, two texts together. Uh, they kind of fit, they fit, fit, uh, they, 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 they're kind of uh, fit together as a whole. What he's saying is democracy equals nihilism. Nietzsche, Nietzsche is the thinker who understood this most clearly. Mussolini and Hitler were the two political figures who sought to learn what Nietzsche had to teach and to apply countermeasures in practice even if they fell short of Heidegger's own deeper understanding of the metaphysical significance of Nietzsche. Well, contemporary Europe, in its view, offers three concrete alternatives, liberalism, communism, and fascism. The first two, in his view, stand for leveling and the historical demise of Europe. The third stands for grandeur and rebirth. These affirmations are not to be found in political speeches delivered by Heidegger in 1933, functioning as a quasi-official of the, of the regime when he was rector, uh, and he, he delivered some truly ugly speeches, but these are delivered in academic lectures on metaphysical topics three to four years later. So there's a pattern here. The collective works was supervised by Heidegger's son, and large decisions about the edition were, it seems, dictated by Heidegger himself. Me. Yeah. I Go ahead. <laughs> I won't stop you. <laughs> I, I will not block your path. <laughs> That's just fine. I'm, I'm getting old too, so I can sympathize. Reinstatement of these texts presumably was deliberate. Why would Heidegger be willing to sanction the publication of texts uh, published posthumously in 1985 and 1988 that he self-consciously repressed, for obvious reasons, because they would discredit him, in 1961 and 1971, respectively? Why would he take these impugning texts and put them back in his books? Well. I have a bit of a theory on this, so I'll share, you, share, share my theory with you. On Heidegger's view, and I, again, Nietzsche and Heidegger, I think, are very similar in this respect. I think what I'm saying about Heidegger applies to Nietzsche, too. On Heidegger's view, one needs to think in centuries. He assumed that people would be reading him for centuries. Just as one continues to read Aristotle, just as one continues to read Hegel, so in the 22nd, 23rd, 24th century, people would be reading Heidegger alongside Aristotle and Hegel. The 20th century, from his point of view, was a lost cause. No point in generating needless hostility to his books, so one should make local, short-term concessions to a benighted age, namely a democratic age, a liberal age, a modern age. But eventually, people would forget Mussolini and Hitler and remember Heidegger. 300 years from now, people would see that philosophically, Heidegger was right, even if he made some tactical mistakes in the 30s. Over the span of centuries, who would care what happened to, uh, uh, who would care what happened in the 1930s? And as we're starting to see, and this uh, diagram here speaks to this, it didn't, it's not taking centuries for people to forget about Mussolini and Hitler. They're already forgetting about them. And that's something that's terribly uh, worrying and should be worrying for, for, for all of us, the, the, how quickly people forget how terrible fascism was. So if what counts is the struggle against modernity spread over centuries, what is needed is a definitive version of Heidegger's views in their historical totality. Hence, the doctrine of his texts in 1961 and 1971 had to be undone or undoctored, that is, annulled. And the same interpretation could presumably be applied to the decision to publish the black notebooks with their unspeakably ugly conjuring up of global Jewish conspiracies interpreted by Heidegger as an essential aspect of the metaphysical heritage of Western rationalism that he seeks to deconstruct. 
The collected works is it advertises being an edition of the last hand, which means that what counts is the final version as authorized definitively by Heidegger. So the version of the text with the Nazi, Nazi text reinstated, that's the real version of the book. What the reinstatement of earlier deletions, or the unknowing of those deletions, tells us is that this final version displays a defiantly un, uh, unrepentant Heidegger with his uh, so-called private national socialism, his national socialism that he regarded as superior to Hitler's, that all remains intact. Nietzsche was certainly compromised by European fascism. For instance, Hitler posed for a state photograph at the Nietzsche archives in Weimar, presided over by Nietzsche's sister, and Hitler sent Mussolini the gift of Nietzsche's collected works. That didn't happen by accident. But with Heidegger, it's much worse. He shamed the proud tradition of philosophy by wearing a Nazi uniform and giving ardently pro-Hitler speeches. Still, I don't endorse Leo Strauss's suggested policy concerning Nietzsche, nor did Strauss himself actually observe that policy, since Strauss obviously taught and wrote about Nietzsche, and a transcripts of uh, one of his courses on Nietzsche has actually been published by the University of Chicago quite recently. Similarly, uncompromising Heidegger critic Emmanuel Fay has controversially suggested that the hundred volumes of Heidegger's philosophy should be moved from the history of philosophy section in university library stacks to the history of Nazism section, which is, was a controversial proposal. <laughs> Again, this it, it, I would consider the wrong response, though much of what Fay writes, in my judgment, on the subject of Heidegger is on target. Nietzsche and Heidegger are towering thinkers and we would be failing to educate our students about the summits of Western philosophy if we cut them out of the curriculum. Philosophy from Plato to Spinoza to Rousseau to Marx has always exposed the fundamental assumptions of established social and political life to radical questioning. And political theory would cease to be what it is and what it should be if radical thinkers of both the left and the right are deemed to be too dangerous to teach. We are not only citizens who have a duty to exercise prudent judgment about civic life, we are also human beings who have a duty to live fully reflective human lives. Our vocation as citizens must make us wary of the dangerous minds in our theory canon. But our vocation as reflective human beings requires dialogue with these dangerous minds while striving to be fully alert to their dangerousness. We have to teach these books, as Jonathan and I both do, and maybe others in the room do, because our students would be left under-educated under in the intellectual traditions of the West if we steered clear of some of the most important books of our philosophical tradition, including Nietzsche's books, including Heidegger's books, but that does not mean that we should teach them without anxiety. Again, think of the potential Richard Spencer who might be sitting in your seminar room, and we can't rule out that possibility. Needless to say, there are complicated scholarly debates about the intellectual legacy of these two overwhelmingly influential philosophers. The culture and intellectual life of the last century would be vastly transformed if we attempted to subtract, subtract them from, the cultural and, or, or from that in cultural and intellectual history. In fact, I don't think their influence could be effaced even if we tried. But that certainly doesn't mean that everyone who has read and been influenced by them is properly aware of the more dangerous aspects of their thought. When Richard Spencer reads Nietzsche, he sees things that are in fact there but that less ideological readers filter out or assume that Nietzsche couldn't possibly have been serious about. Take slavery. In 1872, Nietzsche took upon himself to declare the brutal truth that moderns, he thought, had no wish to hear, that slavery belongs to the essence of real culture. 
this assertion by Nietzsche is no joke. Nietzsche is absolutely earnest about it. Fifteen years later, Nietzsche is still insisting on the same principle. We contemplate the necessity for new orders as well as for a new slavery. For every strengthening and enhancement of the human type also involves a new kind of enslavement, does it not? Go ahead. I can, I can use the moment to get some water. Or take Nietzsche's celebrations of caste morality in the Antichrist. He refers to it as expressive of the natural order, a natural lawfulness of the first rank. And that's fully consistent with what he says on that topic in other texts, in Twilight of the Idols. He condemns Christianity as the decadent counter-movement to any sound morality of breeding of race of privilege. And in Beyond Good and Evil, he writes that democracy came about on account of the mixing of blood between masters and slaves. Arundhati Roy, in her classic The God of Small Things, refers back to a time when paravans were expected to crawl backwards with a broom, sweeping away their footprints so that Brahmins or Syrian Christians would not defile themselves by accidentally stepping into a paravan's footprint. Nietzsche, far from being shocked by a culture that so decisively rejected any kind of moral universalism, as any modern liberal would be, sides with that culture against modernity and pronounces it to be infinitely closer to what he considers the natural order of things than anything modern. In the same vein, he writes, this is Beyond Good and Evil, section 263, many natures have a baseness that suddenly bursts out like dirty water when any sort of holy vessel, any sort of treasure from a closed shrine is carried past. It is a great achievement when the masses have finally had the feeling bred into them that they cannot touch everything, that there are holy experiences that require them to take off their shoes and keep their hands away. And clearly his view is that modernity is condemned because it abolishes that uh, uh, tremendous dis distancing between the elite and the plebs. Now Nietzsche was much, much less of an anti-Semite than Heidegger was, but that didn't stop Nietzsche from writing in one of his last books that the Jews are the most catastrophic people of world history, and that one would no more choose to associate with the first Christians than with Polish Jews. They both do not smell good. For the record, I am a descendant of Jews from precisely the vicinity to which Nietzsche here refers. So that's not a happy passage for me to read. Uh, a year ago, I taught an undergraduate course on politics and religion in the history of political thought, a very rich text with lots of thought-provoking ideas, but also, uh, also lots of truly ugly and offensive rhetoric. Sure enough, one of my students, having picked this text as the topic for his final essay, cited the book directly off of a neo-Nazi website, national, www.nationalvanguard.org. And not an accident, it was there. Despite all the scholarly efforts to cleanse Nietzsche of all meaningful connections to fascism, it's no surprise at all that contemporary Nazis love, that, love this text. And the same applies to Heidegger as well. A website called uh, Arianism.net offers suggested readings for people drawn to their website. Some of these are uh, Nazi texts, some and some aren't, as a lure for the unsuspecting. But among the texts on that web website that decidedly are Nazi is Heidegger's uh, infamous rectoral address of 1933, and it is on that website. The more one familiar, familiarizes oneself with the repellent discourse of the contemporary extreme right, the easier it becomes to pick up distinct echoes of Nietzschean themes and imagery. And it really, uh, you know, one settles one if you've s spent your whole life as I have reading Nietzsche. For instance, it's very hard to read uh, Gudrid Clark's book on neo-Nazi cults, Black Sun, 
very disturbing book without being struck again and again by ne how Nietzsche's work supplies and is understood by such ideologues as supplying an abundant reservoir of defining mythological tropes for these neo-Nazis. How he refers to we Hyperboreans at the start of the Antichrist, which kind of links up with, uh, uh, you know, Nazi mythology that's, again, still deployed to this day, for instance, by uh, Mr. Dugan over there. How he describes the Book of Manu as an absolutely Aryan work. In a letter to Peter Gass dated May 31st, 1888, how he talks about a return to slavery and a new caste system, as I've already quoted. How he tries to fan the sparks of a neo-pagan revival. How he denounces Judaism and Christianity as slave religions and castigates the Jewish origins of Christianity. How he resurrects Zoroaster as a symbol of anti-Christianity and mythicizes about cosmic cycles, and especially how he offers prophecies of a race of supermen who will rescue Europe from the curse of egalitarianism. You can find all of these themes and tropes in contemporary Nazi writers. Nietzsche famously wrote, where are the barbarians of the 20th century? My view about how Nietzsche stands in relation to the Nazis, who of course <coughs> supplied the horrifying answer to that question of Nietzsche's, my view about how, how to think about Nietzsche in relation to Nazis is captured well by something Jason Giorgiani posted online when he broke with his uh, former partner in crime, Richard Spencer, uh, Giorgiani could, could have been easily been part of this diagram as well. Giorgiani helped uh, found altright.com with the lunatic idea in mind that it would contribute to the revival of an aristocratic Aryan empire centered in a reborn, de-Islamicized Persia. And apparently Giorgiani still committed to that uh, crazy project. But, he lamented, this is, was immediately after Charlottesville, within a few days of Charlottesville, and he, he, he bro and quit, quit uh, the altright.com. Uh, why? Because, he lamented, Spencer turned it into a magnet for white trash. As if that would be a big surprise to him, having been a partner of Spencer's for six months. Well, it occurs to me that Nietzsche would have voiced a version of the same risible complaint had Nietzsche been around to witness what the vulgar rabble did with his, uh, his idea of grossa politik 33 years after Nietzsche's death. In an 1884 letter to his friend Malwida von Meisenberg, Nietzsche wrote the following. The sort of unqualified and utterly unsuitable people who may one day come to invoke my authority is a thought that fills me with dread. Yet that is the anguish he goes on, of every great teacher of mankind. Obviously, that's what he considered himself. He knows that, given the circumstances and the accidents, he can become a disaster as well as a blessing to mankind. But he's willing to take that risk. You roll the dice, hopefully it's a blessing. If not, you shrug and maybe try again 100 years later. Here's Connor Cruz O'Brien's perfectly apt response to that anxiety about vulgar Nietzscheanism voiced by Nietzsche himself. O'Brien writes, he was sometimes frightened himself, even this most daring of thinkers, frightened of some travesty of his thought, he said, and the, uh, the, the gentle Nietzscheans, the liberalizing fans of Nietzsche, take comfort from this. Frightened, I think myself, of what he was actually saying and what, of what his messages might affect when they reached minds which were as bold in action as Nietzsche was bold in thought. Uh, O'Brien wrote those lines back in the 60s. Well, we're now in 2018. I think we have to start worrying about precisely those things again. Uh, it's a line that may well haunt us as the politics of the far right emerges, horror movie-like, from the grave in which we thought it was buried. In the same essay, again written in the late 60s, O'Brien also remarked, it is not consoling to think of what some future readers of this master may have in store for us, as if he could already see today's alt-right on the horizon. 
pretty, these are pretty prescient sentences, one has to say. In my book, I endorse Stanley Rosen's judgment that Nietzsche, with his intended destruction of Western bourgeois society, guarantees the vulgarization that Nietzsche feared. That is, himself prepares the way for his return to life in the guise of a self-constructed Frankenstein. For the political philosophical tradition within which Nietzsche and Heidegger stand, the French Revolution inaugurates a moral universe where authority resides with the herd, not with the shepherd, with the mass, the they as Heidegger called it, not with the elites, and as a consequence, ultimately, the whole experience of life spirals down into unbearable shallowness and meaninglessness. Ferdinand Mount, in a recent New York review of books, uh, books uh, essay on Goethe, correctly writes that Nietzsche viewed Goethe as an, an, as an anticipation of the culture of the Ubermensch for which Nietzsche yearned because only Goethe had treated the French Revolution and the doctrine of equality with the disgust they deserved. National socialism, one might say, combined Nietzsche's doctrine of Ubermenschen with Heidegger's doctrine of the necessity of Heimat, homeland, and ethnic rootedness for a properly authentic experience of the world. Now, all this might have seemed irrelevant during the roughly 70 years, 1945 to, say, 2015, when fascism was utterly discredited. 70 years, not very long. This, none of this seems irrelevant today. On the contrary, liberal democracy seems to be increasingly on the defensive. Today, we have Trumpism and Bannonism in the US, Putinism in Russia, and Orbanism in Hungary, uh, Erdoganism in Turkey, Shiism in China, Modiism in India, Dutertism in the Philippines. Admittedly, none of these thinkers uh, none of these uh, leaders, none of these political leaders are as bad as Hitler or Mussolini. But at the same time, none of them are reliable guardians of liberal democracy. Uh, Roger Cohn recently published a New York Times op-ed on the rise of quasi-authoritarianism in Hungary and Poland, in which he quotes a former Polish foreign minister, uh, foreign minister's expression of disdain toward those who believe history is headed inevitably toward a new mixture of cultures and races, a world made up of cyclists and vegetarians who only use rene renewable energy. Uh, it links up with uh, <laughs> Gabe's joke at the beginning. The project of populist nationalists in Poland and Hungary is to defend what they take to be European Christian civilization from such pathetic wimps. This one should not fail to recognize is a 21st century version of Nietzsche's story about the last men. In Dangerous Minds, I quote Richard Spencer's boast that what distinguishes the alt-right from the conventional conservatives despised by Spencer and despised by other members of the white nationalist intelligentsia, the boast that we actually read, we actually read books that's what he said about himself and other people in the alt-right. Well, what are the books that they read? In my book, I also quote a book review on a far-right website, as it happens, Greg Johnson's website, that sketches the alt-right canon. So who are the thinkers who compose this canon? Number one, Friedrich Nietzsche. Number two, Martin Heidegger. Number three, Carl Schmitt. Uh, then Alain de Benoit, Guillaume Fay, two thinkers of the, uh, the European New Right, and again, Alexander Dugan. The one surprising omission from this list is Ju Julius uh, Evola, since he should certainly be on a list of the alt-right canon. In any case, it should be cause for at least some measure of concern that the first three philosophers listed in this canon of the alt-right of the ultra-right are also warmly embraced by the academic left. In 1920s Germany, there was something called the conservative revolution, dubbed as such by Armin Moller, a far-right intellectual. Such conservative revolutionaries, uh, such conservative revolutionism 
is now back in the guise of de Benoit, Dugan, and Steve Bannon. De Benoit, Dugan, and many others are intensely conscious of their movement being a resumption of intellectual trends, fascist trends, basically, from Weimar Germany in the run-up to Hitler. And the books being promoted by far-right outlets like Arctos, Radix, and Countercurrents are a reflection of that. What I'm suggesting in this talk and in my book is that we probably ought to be putting some effort into trying to grasp how some of our favorite authors are being read by people on the far right, since it should help us come to a better understanding of more sinister aspects of their thought that get missed in or are brushed off by liberal and leftist appropriations of them. But uh, <clears throat> that maybe wasn't such an urgent task when fascism appeared to be safely deposited in the trash bin of history. It's looking more and more urgent today. Politics, including theor theorizing about politics insofar as it generates ideas that have effects of various sorts within the political world, always has the potential to generate havoc or worse. The stakes are perhaps particularly high in a political world as unsettled as ours, where technological change is so head-spinningly rapid, where the boundaries between different societies and cultures are being renegotiated on such an epic scale, where the internet lets loose political passions so little inhibited by norms of civility, and where the most powerful man on the planet is someone as volatile as Donald Trump. What we call the liberal arts or liberal education are upheld by a kind of faith that engaging with ideas will indeed contribute to a more liberal, more generous-minded moral consciousness. As a scholar and as an educator, I'm not ready to surrender that faith in the humanizing power of the humanities. On the other hand, how can my confidence in the vocation of theory not be shaken a little, uh, or really more than a little, when I read the chilling words that conclude Greg Johnson's review of my book? These are the closing sentences of his book review on counter the Countercurrents website. Beener did not anticipate what would happen if his book fell into the hands of rightist readers like me. Dangerous Minds is a very helpful introduction to Nietzsche and Heidegger's anti-liberal thinkers. Thus, I recommend it highly. I'm getting recommended by a Nazi. And if I have anything to say about it, this book will help create a lot more dangerous minds, a whole new generation of right-wing Nietzscheans and Heideggerians. Truly chilling words and uh, well, not happy reading for me as in the first review of my book. Higher education in a liberal society involves teaching great representatives of the liberal tradition as well as great enemies of liberalism. Is that the glory of liberal pedagogy or is it its Achilles heel? The sober truth is commitment to a liberal education does not guarantee a commitment to liberalism. Thanks very much. Thanks, Ronnie. That was thought-provoking indeed. And uh, whenever I uh, find myself provoked to think, I turn to Jonathan Allen for help with that. So, Well, I am delighted to <coughs> have the opportunity to respond to Ronald Beener, someone whose work I've read since I was a graduate student but never had the pleasure of meeting until now. <coughs> um, although I am regretful that it's circumstances like these, right, and figures like these, who are the occasion for this meeting. A few years ago, this university took the ill-advised step of <coughs> adopting uh, a slogan, fearless in the face of this, this or that, this, that, and the other. <laughs> and there are certain things concerning which we should be fearful <coughs> in the intellectual world in particular, 
although we have to overcome our fear, right, and be courageous in the way in which we think about them. Teaching philosophy and political theory <coughs> always has the potential to breed monsters. Most great political thinkers hold at least some views I consider repugnant, and what is going on in the minds and the psyches of those who attend our classes is not something over which teachers can or should have any control. I'm not saying this glibly, right, to undercut the urgency of Professor Biener's message. <coughs> I share most of his concerns. I share his anxiety about the evident resurgence of far-right political movements in various parts of the globe, not least this country, and in their growing boldness and willingness to commit terrible acts. It does not help that one of President Trump's first acts was to remove these groups from the FBI's terrorist watch list. Surely it's reasonable for them to conclude that they are now operating in a friendlier political environment and under a president who supports some of their ideas and uses some of their rhetoric. I am concerned, too, that these groups come increasingly armed with ideas and that many of these ideas are stimulated by the philosophies of Friedrich Nietzsche and Martin Heidegger. In fact, I think that may be the most notable development right in these recent shifts. And I agree, too, that we should take these developments absolutely seriously. How do we respond to them? As political theorists always do, by analyzing and criticizing them. As I see it, there is nothing else that I can do. And so I'm going to do just that now. I'm going to ask first, <coughs> what is the source of attraction that Nietzsche's and Heidegger's philosophies exert over people who have no obvious predisposition to the politics of the far right? Second, <coughs> what are the internal weaknesses of the views of life and politics that Nietzsche and Heidegger articulate? To put it differently, do they succeed in advancing the visions to which they are apparently committed? As I'm going to answer no to the second query, my third question is, what alternative and more compelling vision of life and politics is available to us? To my first question, then, what may attract minds who are not predisposed to some or other form of fascism or authoritarianism in the work of Nietzsche and Heidegger? There are several possible factors, and one of them <coughs> was alluded to by Professor Biener, that it is their seductive rhetoric. Nietzsche seduces skillfully with sheer rhetorical virtuosity and variety. He deploys a flurry of impassioned passages, breathless and momentous questions with implied answers, striking aphorisms that lodge in the memory, indirect insinuations that leave a lasting impression without making a direct assertion of fact or logical argument, myths, a host of metaphors with multiple possible meanings, and so on. Heidegger, by contrast, belongs to the school of seduction by clumsiness, <clears throat> or by the sheer overbearing weight of a completely distinctive language, which seems to open up an entirely different and deeper world located beneath the level of our everyday experience. He entangles the reader in this world. But whether the rhetoric is clumsy or dazzling, the effects are very similar. One is to cut off objections that might be raised through a kind of intellectual intimidation. If you are objecting, you are too stupid to have understood the profundity of the vision you are resisting. The second is to imply that if you do understand these views, there is something very special about you. <clears throat> you have a key to the world that is unavailable to most people who are such dullards that they wouldn't know what to do with the key even if they had it in their possession. Both of these effects amount to a form of anti-philosophical intimidation and flattery, and as such, they manifest or encourage serious intellectual and personal vices. But seductive rhetoric alone cannot account for the allure of these thinkers' writing. They also offer a powerful, disturbing, and challenging critique of modern society as nihilistic, <coughs> without values, that often rings uncomfortably true. For Nietzsche, one of the worst legacies of the Christianity that dominated the West for centuries is a moralistic view of the world, a way of seeing and judging everything in moral terms, which will inevitably lead us to recoil from that world with disgust and to act in cramped and punitive ways towards those who don't measure up to our judgments, becoming smug and superficially complacent about ourselves in the process. We have become a society of equals, 
but equally slavish, conformist, and small-minded. Another terrible legacy is the pursuit of truth at all costs, which has generated great achievements, but brought us to a condition in which we are unable to affirm any value at all. Last but not least, the great creative gamble of Christianity to locate the source of all value in another world has left us as confidence in the existence of this other world has waned or become irrelevant to our daily lives with no strong beliefs at all, no creative energy. Heidegger offers a different but related critique of modern superficiality. We have bought into a technological mentality in which we see ourselves as individuals set apart from nature, perceiving subjects who reduce everything around us to inert material that we can use for any purpose. In the process, we've lost any intense sense of our own existence. We sleepwalk, suppressing the consciousness that we will die and of any deeply disturbing, overwhelming experiences of being as something chaotic, uncanny, and weird. We act as if everything is normal as we go about our petty day-to-day -day business, whereas in fact we are playthings of a vast, formless surge of being much larger than we are. As in Nietzsche's picture, Heidegger paints us moderns as petty and contemptible, leading misguided little lives, <coughs> cut off from the vast uncanniness that surrounds us and seeps into us despite our best efforts to protect ourselves from it. I am reminded here <coughs> of a song by the Fleet Foxes, the Helplessness Blues, which was played a lot about five or six years ago, and which runs like this. <coughs> I was raised up believing I was somehow unique, like a snowflake distinct among snowflakes, unique in each way you can see. And now after some thinking, I'd say I'd rather be a functioning cog in some great machinery serving something beyond me. But I don't, I don't know what that will be. I'll get back to you someday, soon, you will see. What's my name, what's my station? Oh, just tell me what I should do. I don't need to be kind to the armies of night that would do such injustice to you or bow down and be grateful and say, sure, take all that you see to the men who move only in dimly lit halls and determine my future for me. And I don't, I don't know who to believe. I'll get back to you someday soon, you will see. If I know only one thing, it's that everything that I see of the world outside is so inconceivable, often I barely can speak. Yeah, I'm tongue-tied and dizzy, and I can't keep it to myself. What good is it to sing helplessness blues? Why should I wait for anyone else? I don't think we can deny that Nietzsche and Heidegger tap into a vein of deep anxiety, sensed disorientation and meaninglessness and unfulfilled longing in our culture. And they do more than that. <clears throat> they offer us visions of a deeper, more intense existence, freed from moral constraints and from the corroding acid of truth and science in which we make or play a part in a great story or quest. For Nietzsche, we must overcome who we are to become truly human. We must become the masters of our own lives. Only a few will really be able to do this, and so they will have to become the masters of others too in a process that will be bloody and will sacrifice hundreds of thousands for the sake of one higher being. The world will divide into masters and slaves. For Heidegger too, we will be able to live at high intensity only if we become part of a movement through which the chaotic force of being speaks and which will give us the sense of meaning we lack. For Heidegger, this meant joining the Nazi party. Who does not feel the desire to live intensely, to take great risks, to learn to master oneself in the process? These are the unfulfilled, often suppressed desires that Nietzsche and Heidegger claim to address but they both offer false solutions to the problems they detect. To deal briefly with Heidegger, <clears throat> to become part of a movement that promises to restore a sense of meaning and intense, authentic existence through common action, shared labor, but above all, war, is no response to the way in which we have turned everything human and natural into a meaningless object for our use. It is the most extreme example of this tendency. The movement uses, uses up, consumes and excretes human material. 
or it simply delivers us into the hands of chaos to suffer and die in the name of a vague but intense experience of being. This is disgusting, but more to the point, it simply radicalizes the instrumentalization of nature and human beings that Heidegger claims to protest against. His solution is incoherent and far worse than the problem he identifies. Professor Biener is absolutely right to warn Nietzsche enthusiasts that the call to freedom from the constraints of rigid morality and concerns about truth is not meant for everyone. It is meant only for a few, for the elite who have the strength of will to handle it. They will be masters of themselves, supposedly, and must be masters of the masses of ordinary people who want and are only fitted to be parts of a machine, material for the master to use as he wills. Let me ask you, in what actual society of slaves and masters have the masters really displayed the kind of inner strength and spiritual superiority Nietzsche claims for them? The answer is none. The qualities that masters actually display are laziness, vanity, a totally false sense of their superiority, and a variety of forms of corruption of character made possible because they view the slaves as means to satisfy their desires. They become stupid, brutal, easily give in to their passions, and are often seized by fear of their underlings, betraying weakness of spirit rather than strength. This has been the case in any real slave society, and it is the point to which those who see themselves as elites in any highly unequal society are moving, whether they realize it or not. This is what Nietzsche's vision of supermen or masters in unequal or hierarchical societies is actually promoting, the direct opposite of the qualities of inner strength he attributes to the masters. As in the case of Heidegger, though through a different process, the vision of intense and powerful existence that Nietzsche advocates collapses into something contemptible and tawdry. The failure is inevitable, built into the vision of existence and politics he offers. This is the vision of the good life for humans that is being advocated by the far right now, once again under the influence of Nietzsche and Heidegger. And so it's no wonder that its spokesmen are such contemptible posers and fakes. <laughs> but any movement that has in its possession a view of the good life for human beings, even if it is a completely incoherent and false one, will win hands down in a contest for hearts and minds against those who have none to offer who can speak only of policies and technocratic solutions. So it seems to me that we have to provide a compelling alternative. The central incoherence of Nietzsche's and Heidegger's vision <coughs> should give us a clue about how to construct one. The notion, their notions of mastery or of an elite marked by a higher existential stance <coughs> team, as Professor Biener points out in his book, with hysterical resentment <clears throat> towards those who supposedly fail to measure up to this high standard. Professor Biener <clears throat> provides two striking quotations that illustrate this. <clears throat> Nietzsche's comment that the great majority of men have no right to life and serve only to disconcert the elect among our races, I do not yet grant the unfit that right. There are even unfit peoples. And Heidegger's remark, an enemy is each and every person who poses an essential threat to the Dasein or existence of the people and its individual members. It is a fundamental requirement to find the enemy, to expose the enemy to the light, or even first to make the enemy, so that this standing against the enemy may happen, and so the Dasein may not lose its edge. How is genuine inner strength possible when it depends crucially on a sense of the threat posed to it by the existence of inferiors? Surely this is a telltale sign of extreme weakness. Far better is Thomas Hobbes's account of inner nobility, stated in a letter to his young aristocratic and misbehaving charge, Charles Cavendish. Uh, I must humbly beseech you to avoid all offensive speech not only open reviling, but also that satirical way of nipping that some use. The effect of it is the cooling of the affections of your servants <laughs> and the provoking of the hatred of your equals, so that he which useth harsh language, whether downright or obliquely, shall be sure to have many haters, and he that hath so, it will be a wonder if he have not many just occasions of duel. <laughs> to encourage inferiors, 
to be cheerful with one's equals and superiors, to pardon the follies of those one converseth with all, and to help men off that have fallen into the danger of being laughed at. These are the signs of nobleness and of the master spirit. For Hobbes, self-mastery and true nobility reach out to others and lift them up, not perhaps as a matter of duty, but as the generous and graceful choice of a truly strong individual. <clears throat> the deepest problem is that Nietzsche and Heidegger insinuate that there is an elite who can live much of the time at the highest levels of creativity and a mass who are swamped by their trivial everyday concerns. Yet in truth, no one can live at such an intense pitch in full consciousness of death all the time or even most of the time. The sharp distinction between intense experience and everyday living needs to be rejected. And those of us who wish to stand against the views of Nietzsche and Heidegger need to see that, in fact, nobility <coughs> and heroism are generated in the lives and concerns of ordinary people in their struggles to support their families, to assist those around them who are sick, to maintain a friendly and cheerful disposition for the sake of others, even when perhaps they feel personally crushed by circumstances. These are challenges we all share. This is the beginning of a counter-Nietzschean and counter-Heideggerian vision of the good life and the beginnings of a politics to counter the love of hierarchy and imposed authority that seems to be seducing more and more people now. This is what we should stand for, not with, without fear, but with good courage. And because this view of the good responds to basic human experiences and needs, this is something we can unite around instead of separating into clusters of divided <coughs> and mutually hostile identities and sub-identities. Thanks, Jonathan, for those edifying remarks, which I can only uh, endorse as well. Uh, we have time now for questions and discussion. I just want to say that was a truly brilliant commentary. It was just really beautiful and eloquent, and I didn't disagree with a single word in Jonathan's. Uh, no, no, we're, we're on the same page. Thanks so much. That was brilliant. Yeah. Okay. But you're gonna have to speak in the microphone, I guess. Okay. No, I don't need to. I don't need to talk to the microphone. I'll uh, turn around and talk to the audience. <coughs> I'm a retired professor here, not not a professor. A retired physician, actually. But I did serve as a. Uh, <coughs> what, what's the word for a kind of professor you are? Huh? Adjunct. Yes, I did adjunct work here, and I worked a lot with university. I was here for 48 years before I retired. Uh, <clears throat> I was involved in a physician's problem, physician-assisted suicide. And <clears throat> I graduated in 1955 from the University of Wisconsin, uh, spent eight years in West Virginia working with coal miners. Do, do you have a, a question for, for Ronald Beener? Yeah. Do you have a question for the speaker? Yeah, I do. I want to tell them something, don't I? I want to know if there are any graduate students here or any scholars, any students in, in this audience. There, there's a few, is that right? So I see one or two heads nod. Uh, there's a library on uh, Nazi genocide. I wrote a book called, uh, uh, I was asked by the Cohotus people to write a story. Uh, uh, I w gave four lectures on Nazi medicine and I was uh, very much concerned about that. And uh, could I ask you, sir, to direct your I'll, I'll question to the speaker? Well, we don't have two minutes, uh, except just one minute, one minute. thirty seconds for a question, please. Right. For a question. The question is: If you know, don't know about it, go down to the library. There is a Cahodas genocide library down there. I've made a lot of contributions to it. I was involved in that and through primarily physician-assisted suicide. If anybody's interested in it, it's down there. It's been going for about 50 years now. Thanks a lot. The question is, why wouldn't anyone go and check that out? <laughs> it sounds great, and if thank you. Don't, if you don't, if nobody goes yeah. down there, Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, sir. Sir, it's a pleasure listening uh, to, your, to your speech. Good, it's, thanks. Uh, thanks wonderful. For coming. 
Uh, Václav Havel had once said, uh, and I paraphrase, um, that the litmus test for their democracy was uh, how the Roma were treated. Uh, and understanding yeah. that there's an uptick in, uh, in racial violence here, yeah. uh, how do you see the information that we have in this uh, setting, uh, the academic setting, getting out to, um, to the masses? I understand there's a lot of other projects like the literacy project, or, uh, literacy project and other things that are, that are happening, but they're not necessarily appealing. How would you, how would you address that? Um, I'm not. I mean, I'm not sure really how to. Uh, the, I mean, it's not something I I work on, and uh, you know, we need all lots of scholarship and research and activism, and we need lots of things to push back against some of these uh, threats. And I support all of that, but I'm a theorist. I'm I I engage with works of theory, and that's a different enterprise. So I, as a citizen, of course, I would support anything within the academy that helps to uh, contain the contagion of, of racism. And uh, yeah, it's very worrying as a citizen. And uh, you know, the kind of little book I've written is a very kind of small effort in a much larger struggle. Uh, you want to follow up here? Yeah, if, if I may. Um, one of the things... I mean, Havel's right. I endorse what Havel said. I mean, Havel is a great man, and uh, I think that's an appropriate test. And un unfortunately, the societies in Europe and here increasingly are failing, failing that test, and that's uh, very disturbing as a, as a citizen. Yeah, exactly. Uh, one of the, I just uh, left the uh, Department of Defense uh, retiree. Um, the, uh, one of the things that I noticed the uh, joint staff was doing was actually uh, presenting training, um, annual training, uh, to the masses within the DOD to try to prevent or counter uh, the you know, disinformation and fake uh, news and everything else that's right. been contributing yeah. uh, to this problem. And, um, and also looking at it from, uh, uh, from a logical you know, fallacy kind of perspective to you know, educate the masses. Yeah. Um, so those are things that we're doing, uh, yeah. or that the government is doing now that I'm out of it. Uh, and I'm wondering if there's any kind of um, way of us being able to promote that in the uh, civilian realm. Um, well, the government's led by a president who's trying to diseducate people, so that's a huge problem for political life in this country. Um, I have a question about, um, I'm, I'm just curious about what you think about the and then maybe there's scholarship being done on this already, and I don't, I just, I'm completely unaware of it. But I'm wondering about, um, given the fact that one of your um, students seems to have pointedly uh, called you out uh, in, 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 in a, as a, as a response to a um, assignment, um, do you think that the, the perception of the academy as a liberal uh, mechanism, mechanism of liberalism, um, are, are there students like who are using the, um, the t you're, you're teaching Nietzsche, yeah. and, and are, are, they, are they coming back at you, um, you know, and using their like, they're angry with the liberalism of of the academy, and just using that. I, I, I mean, I'm, I'm not sure what. So the, it started with the student who was calling me out. I'm not sure what that's referring to. Uh, You're talking about the student who picked up the yeah, Antichrist yeah. from that website. Yeah, yeah. He didn't know what he was doing. <laughs> I mean, right, right, he yeah. wasn't on the ball enough to see that it was a Nazi website. I saw that it was a Nazi website. Oh, oh okay. He, it wasn't like he was trying to get back at or you know push back at me or something or oh, I see. he had no idea he had no idea I mean he didn't know what he was doing all right then I guess my follow-up question is do you think that the the connection between um, fascists uh, you know people picking up on Nietzsche as a, and becoming fascists is, is more perhaps related to them responding to their uh, kind of aggression against the academy as a as a as a liberal like arm somehow. You know, if you're in the university, then you're part of that liberal culture. 
or you should be. Uh, you know, I think people have to be alert. They don't know where things are coming from and what the so people are just, you know, picking up things from the internet, tropes, memes, and just redeploying them thoughtlessly without realizing that this is these are coming from some very ugly places in a lot of cases. And uh, and uh, it's a failure of citizenship. And education should be in the service of citizenship to make people more aware of what these things mean. And so here's a case. How could you know be, you be so clued out to to take something from a Nazi website and not realize what you're doing? That's a kind of a pretty serious infraction against intelligent, <laughs> educated citizenship. Uh, you know, it happened to be in a university, but you know, I think that's going on across the whole society. Um, people are just, you know, the agents of ugly politics or the carriers of it, often without fully uh, uh, weighing the seriousness of these tr tropes and memes that, of which they are the carriers. Uh, it, it's a failure both of education and of citizenship, of educated citizenship, of intelligent citizenship, discerning citizenship. I mean, the responsibility of a citizen is to exercise good judgment. Well, if you, if you vote for racists, that's not very good judgment. <laughs> and, uh, yeah, so. We have a, a question here from our colleague, Professor Anthony Ullman. And uh, while he's uh, asking his question, if others would line up at the mic, that would be the most efficient sure. way. It would okay, save sure. me running around. No, 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 you're, you're, you're OK. <laughs> Thank you for your talk. Sure. Uh, I have a question about the practical upshot of what you said for uh, we teachers. Uh, I teach Nietzsche and, and Heidegger over in the philosophy department on a regular basis. Yeah. And uh, my teaching approach has always been to say, here are the views and, and, and their arguments for the views, and here are some criticisms. Uh, you students make up your own mind. I don't try to push one side or the other. I say, look, this is a, a room where we have rational discourse. Here are the arguments and the objections. I'm not going to tell you what you ought to believe. Is your suggestion that that's the wrong strategy when it comes at least to Nietzsche and Heidegger and that we ought to be more partisans in the classroom? I wouldn't, I, I certainly wouldn't put it that way. Uh, it's not a question of being a partisan against Nietzsche and Heidegger. It's a question of making people aware of things that they might miss in reading. I mean, the, the common tendency is people read them in a way that filters out what's dangerous. So you have to at least, if you're going to be engaging with these thinkers and dialogue with these thinkers, as you should be, as a student of the philosophy canon, that you you know uh, apply adequate hermeneutics such that you know what what these ideas really are and how uh, uh, challenging they're intended to be in relation to the society you're living in. Because obviously, a lot of readers and a lot of people who take them in courses, it's as if they're not really weighing the full depth of what's being challenged here. Uh, I mean. Most students you teach uh, assume uh, a general commitment to ideas of individual dignity and equality. And it, it's hard to kind of really, uh, for it to penetrate that, well, here are philosophers who don't believe in that. And not only don't believe in it, but think that it is radically dehumanizing and that it's responsible for a hollowing out of our cultural and spiritual experience. And so they read them, and they miss that. <laughs> well, if you miss that, then that's a big failure of education. So yeah, uh, as a teacher, you have to make them aware that like all the things you believe in are being uh, challenged root and branch. And if you don't see that, it's not a proper dialogue. That's, you know. So a big part of it is not just saying, you know, uh, polemicizing against them to discredit them but to, to really understand what you're in dialogue with. That's, that's the spirit in which, so it's not uh, partisan, I wouldn't say partisan, it's having a more adequate dialogue. And well, people become, with, on the basis of that understanding, they go on to be fascists. Well, it's not a happy outcome. I wouldn't be happy about that. But, but my primary job as a teacher is to try and do justice to what's in these texts. And I don't think you can do that without realizing how profoundly anti-democratic and anti-liberal and anti-egalitarian they are. And if you're missing that, you're missing, you know, I think the center, uh, certainly of Nietzsche. 
And, and, and I, in that respect, I think Heidegger is a Nietzschean. All right. Hello. Um, in, in your book, you, well, in your book and here, you describe the problem of the um, reception of Heidegger across a sort of political line from the far right into like the generally left wing academy. Um, you also discuss in your book uh, briefly Heidegger's taste for um, Holderlin, uh, who was in the kind of milieu of Vienna Romanticism in Germany, was right. quite closely tied to Hegel. Hegel being another thinker who has been received o over time across many sort of political sure. lines. We know sure. Marx, Kodiev, left Hegelians, right Hegelians, just like left Nietzscheans, right Nietzscheans. Oh yeah. Inclu uh, uh, including even like Giovanni Gentile in, in fascist sure, Italy. Sure, sure, there are right Hegelians, sure. Um, and so, again, in your book, you recommend that uh, left-wing Heideggerians, I think the word you use is close-up shop, um, or phrase. Um, but I guess regarding this general phenomenon of thinkers, theorists, to constantly always be sort of received across political lines, be able to be able to have their thought cross these political boundaries and serve various different ends. How to how to deal with this it, thing as, as an event that keeps happening? Yeah. Maybe. Uh, I'm not sure what the question was. How, how do we understand this as a phenomenon? If, even if we recommend that, say, uh, left wing Heideggerians close up shop, nonetheless, we do have this sort of problem of thinkers constantly crossing yeah. political lines and serving okay. various ends, let, dubious or not. Let me explain what I meant by closing up shop. If you think that Heidegger, as a philosophical resource, is going to help promote progressive or egalitarian politics or radically democratic politics, you're looking to him for something he can't supply because he doesn't believe in any of those things. So... And so, you know, left Heideggerianism as an intellectual enterprise is founded on the idea that he's a helpful resource for people committed to a politics of the left. And, and they, I mean, it's like my answer to the previous question. They haven't sufficiently plumbed the extent to which Heidegger is emphatically a thinker of the right, just as Nietzsche is, according to his own understanding, emphatically a thinker of the right, and so is Schmidt. Uh, so the idea that, w that you can appropriate these in ways that will advance, you know, political projects that these thinkers themselves would have utterly despised is a dubious project. And, and again, it, it would, we can only attempt to pursue this project by filtering out the things that are pretty central to these thinkers. So that's what I meant by, you know, maybe, you know, especially in our current circumstances where now these are thinkers are being appropriated not just by the academic left, but by these thinkers of the radical right, it's time to take another look at maybe what's being missed or what's being filtered out or what's being, you know, domesticated or liberalized or whatever, uh, and to rethink whether, in fact, these are appropriate resources for pro political projects of the left. That's, that's uh, you know, that's the challenge, challenge in my book. Uh, I mean, Greg Johnson in his re review acknowledges this, that, that, you know, and Leo Strauss does as well, that, that uh, almost all academic Nietzscheanism and Heideggerianism is left Nietzschean and left Heideggerian. That's just a fact. Uh, there aren't, it'd be very tough to find right Nietzscheans or right Heideggerians in the academy. I mean, Johnson was briefly, he didn't last long, not surprisingly. So the dominant, you know, teaching of Nietzsche and Heidegger is as if these can be resources for, uh, you know, people who are progressive and radically egalitarian. And, uh, well, that's, I think, now needs re-examination in a context. I mean, my general view is kind of, you know, left Nietzscheanism, left Heideggerianism are pretty uh, benign, you know, in an age when fascism is safely deposited in the rubbish bin of history. It should have stayed there, but it crawled out, and, and now it's not so benign. Uh, uh, you know, if there are no fascists around, then fine, let's turn Nietzsche and, you know, give Nietzsche a, a leftist spin. But we're in a whole different world now. Or it seems, I mean, maybe it'll last a very short time and we can, you know, go back to being complacent about this. But right now we can't be complacent. Uh, you know, the, the 
you know, I'm haunted, as I think we should all be, by Bannon's suggestion that we are now in, in, you know, in the presence of a new political order. And we have to, you know, uh, and, and we continue to be haunted by that suggestion of Bannon's until the fascists, you know, depart the scene. But there's no guarantee they will. Okay, so we are um, now uh, in a position where we have 10 minutes before they uh, kick us out. So we're in the rapid fire, rapid sure. round, what yes. do they call it? Um, lightning one, round. Quick question, quick answers. Okay. okay. Lightning I round. My answers All right. I have uh, three lightning round questions right now. Uh, my first one, would you draw uh, certain parables between groups that are the uh, white nationalists and with other, I guess, groups around the world, such as Al Qaeda and other different organizations that sort of fantasize violence. That's one. Uh, you, you're I, not going to ask three questions, oh, are you? Because that that'll take me okay, probably uh, half I'll an get hour to, to my, answer I'll, that then one. I'll just sorry. I'll just yeah. get to my. Uh, I guess. No, my that was a very good question. I'm not sure we want. <laughs> oh well, okay. then I guess my one question it, and one answer. But I guess uh, the other two are just complementary to the third question, which is, how does uh. You mentioned certain like ideas and certain uh, what what my professor over there, Jonathan At Allen, has asked as well is the show bravery and the sign of certain like ideas. Yeah. My question is, uh, how does a uh, certain idea, uh, I guess, bravery and stuff, and dealing with others who are not so brave in dealing with hard powers, such as in case what we've seen from many different groups or anywhere around the world, is the threats of death and violence right there. How do yeah. and those who are not so brave, how would you? Uh, I guess, address, like, deal with the ideals of hard power, pretty much, and pretty much use of violence and force against others. Thanks. Well, Thank you. It. Both of those are enormous questions. I think it's easier for me to answer the first, really. So I do believe that there are commonalities between ISIS and the kind of existential extremism that I see in Nietzsche and Heidegger. And I talk about this a little bit in an earlier book of mine, Civil Religion. And uh, Paul Berman, I think, also, uh, you know, that there, and people have suggested that ISIS is a kind of fascism. So what, what, what does that mean, to describe it as a kind of fascism? Well, uh, you know, I think the, the sense in which Nietzsche is a gateway to fascism, I think, is relevant to that. that I, namely, that, you know, a human life only counts as a meaningful human life if it rises to some superlative level of drama, grandeur, greatness, you know, reach, reaching the summits. And in a sense, that's what uh, ISIS is after, merely human, ordinary human life, the ordinary people leaving ordinary lives is not sufficient. You got to conquer empires, you got to change history, you have to recraft re the whole landscape of human life. In that sense, ISIS is kind of aiming at, you know, and trying to be New Nietzsche and uh, Ubermenschen. Excellent uh, question, great answer, couldn't uh, agree more. Okay. Who's next? Uh, all right, so uh, I've tried to boil this down in my head uh, as much as I can. Um, I suppose my question is basically, to those who do feel um, that Nietzsche was right about a sense of horizonlessness in the yeah. modern society, uh, what would you offer as an alternative um, as opposed to people becoming committed Nazis or, or maybe on the left becoming committed communists trying to find meaning in, in a political ideology where they maybe feel like they've lost that in, the, like Nietzsche says, the death of God, where there's, there's no longer uh, religion as is important a part in people's lives. That's another very big question. It would probably, again, to require a very extensive and uh, you know, long answer. But to just the short answer, in principle, it should be possible to commit themselves to a, a, an ideal of robust citizenship that is meaningful and, and gives, allows them to lead meaningful lives. Why do we have to be heroes? Why do we have to conquer the world? Why do we have to, you know, build empires and, in order to have meaning? Why? I mean, I think, you know, Nietzsche is just a little too hysterical about nihilism and too quick to jump to the judgment that our lives are nihilistic. Uh, why is democracy nihilistic? I mean, it's a crazy idea. 
Um, sure, surely it's possible to live in a liberal democratic society and, I mean, this is, I think, you know, the gist of what uh, Jonathan was uh, uh, sketching with his appeal to Hobbes, and I totally agree. There are, there are more modest uh, uh, ways of uh, generating meaning for human, human life, and uh, it just seems a little exaggerated to say, you know, if you're not uh, killing uh, uh, large numbers of people and conquering empires, then it's all just meaningless. It's a great point. Okay, Perhaps what Daniel Bell called the cultural contradictions of capitalism are working against uh -huh. us in, in this uh -huh. regard. Uh -huh. Who's next? Oh, right here. So just a short question and uh, hopefully a short answer. Oh, good. Oh, good. Do you think potentially moving forward that the concept that the university is potentially uh, more predominantly left may ostracize some people with right-leaning tendencies to maybe seek out more dangerous websites, like you said, like the Vanguard website? Do you think that's a problem that just the concept that the university is more left-leaning? Well, let me again correct this business about the, you know, nationalvanguard.com or whatever it was. He didn't seek out that website. He was seeking out a text without paying for it. And he happened to stumble on this website. Now, there is a reason why it was on the website, but he didn't care where he got it from. He just didn't want to have to go to a bookstore and pay for the book. So it had nothing to do with seeking out anything. As for how dominant, uh, you know... Liberals or leftists are in the <laughs> academic world. I think I, I wouldn't have such a monolithic view. I think it varies from college to college, from department to department, discipline to discipline. I, I don't see that kind of monolithic, you know, leftists rule the university. I mean, it's in the interest of uh, certain people to present universities that yeah. way. But I've, you know, I've lived in universities my whole life, my whole adult life, and, and there's all kinds of people in universities. And, and I would definitely agree, but I, the, my question was... Hopefully think there are no fascists, but, you know, there should be conservative in any... I mean, I believe in intellectual pluralism, and there should be conservatives. But the, and con it's a the concept if that liberals are it's too left dominant. may ostracize people from not going to college and maybe not seeking out the proper channels for discussion and stuff. That what does that? That the concept, not that I'm not saying that the left, um, the universities are predominantly left, but that the concept that it is predominantly left may ostracize people from going well, to university. Oh, that's a great shame. Stuff. Yeah, that would be a great shame. Thank great you. question. Good uh, points being made. Yeah. Hello again, Doctor. Here we Gaynor. go again. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, this is a yes or no question. Um, you and Doctor Allen both spoke of monsters. I think we see the many-headed monster of fascism and populism rising. Is it possible for conservatives to play Bellerophon to the chimera of fascism? Wow. <laughs> Thank you. You want to elaborate a little bit on that? Uh, okay, yeah. so Bellerophon was the, I believe, Greek hero who, with Pegasus, fought chimera. You're more educated about Greek mythology than I am. Uh, so the idea of the question is, are conservatives able to act to... Uh, stifle or stymie or stop fascism, or are they part of the problem? Well, anybody who can help in preventing the rise of fascism is to be welcomed. And I mean, you know, conservative, these are very elastic conservative, conservative, liberal, leftists. I mean, so what's a conservative? So you'd have to give a, you know, get into a whole long account of, so who counts as conservative in what sense and what, you know, just I, I I'd be resistant to just kind of being too quick to attach these labels, but I would say that if someone sees the return of fascism as 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 a terrible danger and is willing to contribute to a broader you know coalition trying to prevent this, they are to be welcomed with open arms, whatever labels they attach themselves. And one would hope, that liberals and conservatives and leftists would all be joined in common cause in that kind of struggle. Uh, I, it's hard for me to get around the idea, you know, get my head around the idea of a conservative who would be complacent about fascism. I, I mean, you know, this country fought a war against fascism. A lot of people died fighting to protect liberal democracy from fascism. That was not a kind of trivial uh, moment in history, and, and I lost two it, grandfathers very it should so. be very disturbing to all of us that 70 years later, we're seeing signs of it coming back. You know, it, it's pretty alarming that, that liberal democracies have that 
level of amnesia such that 70 years later, they, that, that, that this can, can come out of the trash bin, you know? I Thank have you, a question. Does anyone have my notepad, my other notepad with the emails on it? And with that, I turn it it's to the final yeah. substantive question of the night, which is yours, sir. Yeah. Oh, me? Yeah, you're the yeah, final me. question. <laughs> Well, I just uh, listening, and uh, I was thinking that you had that thing with that uh, in Charlottesville, right on the cover. And the thing, yeah, and, and my thing was, uh, uh, there's nothing more pitiful than a scared white man, eh? But the whole thing is, ain't it come down to, if you look up there and you look at our political thing today, they're afraid of losing power. Does that have a lot to do with it? Yeah, it does. You know? I mean, it seems simple, but... Sometimes simple... Th for that kind of stuff. Sometimes simple theories are correct. Folks, I want to thank you all, most of all, for coming out tonight and making this a great occasion and a wonderful conversation. I hope to see you again uh, at uh, one of these events. And please join me in thanking the great Ronald Beener. <laughs> Thanks a lot. That's fun. Good.